Cindy, do we have the sign-up sheet for public comment? Right here. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. All right, it is 7 o'clock. If there is anybody here for public comment, if you can sign in up here, um, that would be great. We just need your name and, and address and the topic that you're talking about. Um, but it is 7 o'clock, and so I would like to... Um, call the meeting to order. Nikki, can you call the roll? Yeah. Nikki Austin is present. Bridge Jeffrey is absent. Eric Gekdahl? Present. Terry Ellison? Present. Teresa Keene? Present. Cheryl McGuire? Mm -hmm. No. Nope. Dylan McGuire? Here. Phil Vosberg? Present. Tim Wolf? Present. Looking for an approval of the agenda for our meeting November 28, 2022. So moved. Second. Is that Terry? Yep. Yes. And second by Nikki to approve the agenda for the Board of Education meeting on November 28, 2022. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Good. Carries. We're moving on to consent items. Is there anybody on the board who wants to remove a consent item for further discussion? All right, hearing none, we will approve the Board of Education minutes from November 14th, 2022 board meeting, our special Board of Education meeting on November 15th, our additional special board meeting on November 15th, and another board meeting on November 16th. Um, approve receipt and expenditures from October 2022, and approval and acceptance um, with incredible gratitude of community donations the Sadoff Family Fund, $410 to the high school cross country team. The Road Rally Adventures, $550 to Backpack Buddies. Howard and Marianne Johnson, $30 to Backpack Buddies. And Joanne and David Babbler, $50 to Backpack Buddies. So again, incredibly grateful and appreciative of those community donations. So if I can get a motion to approve the consent <coughs> item. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Tim and a second by Eric to approve the consent items as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. This is now time for public comment. Is there anybody here for the purpose of public comment? Eric? Um, so then we have approval of um, NEOLA, so old business discussion approval of NEOLA policies and updates. This is the second reading of our um, NEOLA policy updates, and there's a long list of policy updates, and I will turn that over to Mr. Figueroa to explain those. So we did have policy committee uh, preceding the, the last board meeting, mm -hmm. and we did discuss the policy um, additions that were made according to uh, our board practices and there were no changes from that last policy so my recommendation would be to move them out as they are so again this is these have gone through policy committee this is the second reading by the full board and so looking for a motion to approve um, the the uh, policies and amendments to the policies as presented so moved. Second. A motion by Nikki and a second by Terry to approve the um, 17 <coughs> NEOLA policy updates. All those in favor by voice vote signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. All right, we are on to new business and our first order of business is an academic update on our school report cards. So with that, I will turn that over to Tom. Yeah, tonight's update um, will be on our district report card scores. Um, tonight, really, we're just going to focus on giving you guys some information of what makes up the score, what's their district scores, um, what are the different priority areas, and then we'll, we'll, we will have some time <coughs> at the end uh, to talk some specifics about um, our high school. Jeremy's going to share a little bit of detail about some information around their score, and then some details of some of the work that's happening there. Um, more in-depth conversations of 
the work at the buildings specifically will be done at the curriculum meeting in December. Um, so we won't probably get into too much detail and then, unless there's a specific question that pertains to a building. Uh, but we'll focus on more of the district scores and then a little bit at the high school. So we're going to jump in. First, what makes up the report card score? For some of you, you've heard this before if you've uh, been part of the board, but I'm just going to do a quick review. Um, report card score is made up of four priority areas. You have achievement, you have growth, um, on track to graduation, and then the newest priority area starting last year was targeted group outcomes. So I'll provide a little bit more detail on, on what goes into each as I go through some of the scores. But those are the four priority areas that make up the total score, which is out of 100, um, and then places our district um, in one of these categories, and then each of our schools as well. So looking specifically at our district score, our overall score is a 63. Point one. Um, this is up from the previous year where we were 59.7. A couple things to point out um, on this visual um, that's important is um, if you look at our demographics, you can see that um, we're 14.2 for special ed, around 40% for economically disadvantaged, and then 4.5 for EL learners. And then our student groups there, you can see that we're 84% uh, white, and our biggest group is the Hispanic Latino. Uh, group at 12 percent. Um, the pie chart on the bottom, um, which is the priority weight score, um, that tells us where each of those categories, those four priority areas, and how they're weighted. And you can see as a district, we're heavier with growth. Um, achievement is less, and that is calculated based on your economically disadvantaged percentage. So around 40 percent, so more of our score is focused on growth. Um, less on achievement, um, on track to graduation and target groups are both equally split at 25%. Each building has this little pie chart um, and it's different based on the demographics for each building. But as a district, um, it's 28% um, versus 21% uh, with growth for th versus achievement. Questions around that? I'll try to pause, let you guys look at it. Overall, it meets expectation as a district. Um, and I'm just going to point out that's true for every district, right? So not only are buildings weighted different when you look at an overall score, score when you compare different districts, each of those di different districts have different weightings as well, correct? Yep. So that economically disadvantaged number, if that is down, much lower, then you'll see that achievement part of the pie be much bigger. And that's different yeah, per district. we look at the four different priority areas, we'll start with achievement. 61.6, um, what that score is, is a multi-year average of students um, in terms of academic achievement. And you can look at ELA and math, um, which has been a consistent trend that we perform at or above the state average, um, and is actually a strength across the district um, in both of those areas. And we look at three years of data, so it's looking at 21-22, uh, 2021 and then 1819 because we skipped the 1920 years. So we're actually going back to 1819 for student data that's compiled to make up that 61.6 uh, for a score of achievement. We go over to growth. Um, growth is lower, um, certainly an area that we have targeted for improvement. You can see that we're below the average um, for both ELA and math. What makes up growth? Um, it's a little bit more complex. To simplify it is looking at how students grow year to year, um, but it does compare them to like students. Um, and students obviously that score above like peers, that's going to be a positive towards the number. Students that score below a like peer, um, obviously that's going to impact your score in a negative way. And we have our targeted group outcomes. Uh, this is new, like I said, as of last year. It takes the bottom 25% with student achievement, so each building has a bottom 25% of students that fall into this category, and that group of students gets their own little mini report card. So you can see that achievement, growth, um, attendance, and graduation is all compiled into that part of that target score, 
Um, 50 percent of that targeted group is focused on growth. So it's heavily weighted with growth when we look at that targeted group of students. And the idea is they want district schools to have a focus on closing gaps for kids and making sure that there's systems and resources in place to make sure that um, students that fall into that bottom 25% um, are getting support they need to be successful and to grow. And you can see that score for us is lower and certainly fits with that growth component. Um, that's area that we need to improve across the district. Um, and then we have on track to graduation. Um, you look at attendance, you look at graduation, we're above the state average. And again, with achievement, um, third grade ELA above the state average. I think that's been a consistent trend. And then eighth grade math, quite a bit above the state average. So our student achievement, again, is certainly something that um, is a celebration, um, something that we feel is, is a positive. Um, obviously, you have two areas with growth and targeted groups are areas that we need to focus on. Questions on those four areas? Can you just touch on the chronic absenteeism? Because it looks like it's a negative, right? Like, we don't have 91% chronically absent. Like, the, the rest of them look like, here's our graduation rate, here's our, here's our attendance rate, here's our, so I think just to address what that's measuring, so people understand that that doesn't mean we have 90%. Yeah, I mean, it's looking at students that are absent for a certain number of days mm -hmm. um, in the school year. Um, and I'm not sure exactly about digging into the numbers of what that threshold is. Do you guys know what that threshold is? Is it 10 or more? Yeah, I don't know what it is for the report card for the individual, individual truancy is three or more unexcused absences within a year. Um, but the 91.2 is not an indication of 91.2% of people gone. Correct. It's actually a score out of 100 of the kids that are there. Mm -hmm. like, so it's only saying um, that mm -hmm. there are 8.8 .8 students percent of students that are falling under the definition of chronic okay. I just think, just to clarify, because yeah. I think if you look at that, it looks like we have a large sure. absent, yeah. it's but it's, it's of kind of the opposite think. of what you think, yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? <clears throat> I think one other thing with that targeted group, because that's a critical group for us, the achievement level is significantly low at 19.2 for an overall score there. And that's the bottom. Yeah. Yep. And I'm assuming that that varies if it is truly bottom 25. That's why there's no benchmark data. So it's based off of previous year data, and it's going to change. Um, which one of the things in looking at the information, that number won't change much year after year because you're going to have a new bottom 25 percent. So it's super important that you have a system in place that supports all students, right, um, and all of their needs. Um, but that group will change every single year. So you want to make sure you have a good plan in place to support those lowest 25% of students. All right, take a look at individual buildings. Quickly here, I put the previous year's overall score um, next to the 21-22 score, um, and then I provided just each priority area scored for you guys to take a look at. A couple things um, to note, we had, most of our buildings stayed relatively same. A few went up a little bit, a few went down a little bit. I think our biggest um, change was the middle school going from 60.9 to 67.4. Um, we have one building in Abe that significantly exceeds expectations with an overall score of 84.7. Um, and then we have uh, Northside that um, exceeds expectations, and then Parkside and Middle School um, meet expectations, and High School meets few expectations. So those are the overall radius of scores for each building. Um, I think Abe Lincoln, um, one thing just to point out there is, one, their growth is, is really good um, at 92.5. Um, the other contributing factor is they don't have a score for targeted groups because their students tested um, and total enrollment is so small that they don't have enough to make up the total number that fits into that targeted group. You have to have 20 or more students. <clears throat> so there's just weighted on the three areas, which is achievement, growth, and then the on track. And then I think the other thing to point out is you certainly look at the high school total number, which is 51.0, or 50.2, 
Uh, the two areas that really bring that score down is the targeted groups and the growth scores. Any questions related to that? couple takeaways, start with the celebrations, and then we'll talk about certain areas we need to improve in. Um, talked about overall achievement being at or above state average in ELA and math. I think that's a consistent trend um, over a number of years and across all the buildings. Um, our on track to graduation, I talked about third grade ELA, I talked eighth, about eighth grade math, being above the state averages. Um, we have high graduation rates, we're obviously above the state averages in those other areas. Um, even though growth and that growth score is low. I did look at just 21, 2021 versus 21, 22, and there is increases in terms of our ELA, growth score, our math, and then the overall. So that's, even though it's not where we want it to be, it certainly is trending in the right direction. And then you same thing for our target score. It's low and it needs to be higher, um, but it's better than it was in 2021. And um, it showed an increase of around seven points. And then <clears throat> areas to address um, target groups and growth. Those are the two areas that as a district at the high school, I'd say consistently probably across all of our buildings would be areas that um, we'd like to see improve. Um, we feel like the work that we're doing within our PLC work um, and some of the other changes we're making um, within the district, we feel like are addressing this. And I highlighted just the vertical alignment of curriculum and identifying those power standards and learning targets and aligning that work to the state assessments and to what kids need to be successful as they move throughout the grades. Talk about instruction, making sure you have targeted instruction and it's focused on taking kids where they're at along that progression of learning. Start to do a lot of work there and then systems of support, making sure that we have multi-tiers of support to support students that need help uh, with power standards and learning targets, but also with some of those foundational skills that kids may lack, even at the high school, um, and making sure that we have systems in place in all five of our buildings that we're able to do that. And that's work that I know Joe's talked about and that we've talked about at our previous meetings that that's a priority area um, that we've been focused on and making sure those things are in place because I think we know if, if they are, uh, we're going to have success. I think Abe's a good example of that. Um, we've talked about that in the past of having high growth. You have systems, you have resources. Um, certainly their student numbers are a little bit more manageable than other buildings. But when you have those things in place with good instruction, good leadership, um, positive results are going to follow. And I just want to mention subgroups. Um, we have Subgroups that obviously play a role um, in our report card, our growing ELL numbers um, certainly plays a role. Um, and we've targeted that group in improving our programming. Um, we recently did our program review. Joe's done a lot of work with special ed and getting kids into the classroom and accessing uh, core tier one. Um, and then just making sure that um, we also recognize there's a big gap for student achievement with our economically disadvantaged students. Those are our three big subgroups that we have as part of our 80-50 goal um, because we really need to close those gaps and help those kids improve. So those are the two areas across the district um, that you know, we're focused on within the work. I think we feel pretty confident with um, everything we're doing that is addressing those things to hopefully move our scores within the targeted group and growth area in a positive way moving forward. It's not going to happen quickly or overnight because there is a lot of data that's averaged in part of those scores, so it's going to take us a little bit of time, but we feel like we've got you know, measures in place to monitor things throughout the year so we can adjust um, and monitor the work as we implement some of these things. Jeremy, I think maybe now I'd have you jump in here and talk a little bit about the high school um, and things that you guys are working on to address. Yeah, sure. I mean, first of all, obviously we're frustrated at the high school with that score as well. Um, it feel, it doesn't feel like in the building from what I see and from what people are doing in the building that that should be the score that we're that caliber of a school. 
Um, I've reached out to DPI, to multiple meetings with Todd and the team here, with other principals in um, the county, other principals in our conference of like schools, because it is important, like Teresa said, to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples as much as possible with how schools are, uh, are measured. Um, and the thing that we keep coming away with, Todd, Todd summed it up, we do really, not, I shouldn't say really well, we do well with student achievement. We stack up with other schools um, where we are commensurate with them, commensurate with the state average, or even higher than them um, in some areas. And that's consistent. I did some charts from five years of, of uh, achievement for math and ELA for ninth, 10th, and 11th grade. Um, and when I get frustrated about this, I talk to, like I said, other principals, and they're, they're the first ones to tell me, Jeremy, your students are performing at a better rate of proficient and advanced than our school is. And then, it, and then I get more frustrated because they say, well, then why is our score? Your report card score, score is 15 to 20 points higher than ours. And what it comes down to is we're not doing a very good job with that growth piece, especially the targeted growth piece, um, which is the, the lowest 25% of, of performing students. So we need to do better with that. Um, the good thing is we are already doing that. We have some plans in place. Um, we're doing the PLC work just like the rest of the district where we're identifying um, our essential learning targets and our, our power standards. Um, we uh, are making sure that we are uh, measuring the attainment of those skills um, in all of our classes so that we know that kids are getting it or not getting it. We're intervening in the classroom with our guaranteed recovery time. We're intervening with flex um, to pull students in who don't get it through all that uh, multiple times to make sure that they do get it. We're talking as a district team about what is the next level? So we have the classroom instruction, we have the guaranteed recovery time, we have the flex time. Teachers are doing all of that and pulling them in multiple times and the student's still not getting it. What's next? Um, so we're talking about do we need to have some type of reading interventionist, math interventionist at the high school? We've never had that before. We've never had this system before, to be very honest with you. Um, the next thing we're going to be doing is looking at the targeted group of students, which we have identified those students. We know who they are. Tim, to your, um, to your point, it's 173 students in our high school. We've already met with those students and tried to whittle that down because that's a fairly unmanageable number to a skill versus will problem, what kids really didn't take the test seriously and what, really, what kids really did struggle with it. And then next week, we're going to be giving them a screener to try to di further diagnose and, accept and assess what are the barriers. Is there a reading fluency issue, reading comprehension issue, a math number sense or a math fluency issue? And then determine what can we do to intervene with that, with the skill set of our staff that we currently have. Um, so we do have some plans in place for intervening with that. Um, and the whole big idea of how we're going to measure this and how we're going to know that we're getting better, and I do feel we're getting better, is we have those um, learning targets and power standards that are, when we picked them, we said, what pick standards and pick targets that they absolutely must have to be successful, not only in your course, but in future courses and success in high school and is assessed on the ACT. So our idea is to measure the skill attainment on Mastery um, Connect, making sure that they ha all the students have the skills. If they don't, we intervene. And then from that, those skills should be aligned to the ACT. And we have two practice ACTs, as you know, that we get for a year. So we should see a growth on, on that ACT. We gave one in October, September maybe. Um, and we have one coming up here in January again. We did that last year as well, but those should equate if we can connect those dots to further or better performance in the March ACT and the April pre-ACT. So that is how we're measuring that success and that student growth. Um, I can't say it's a perfectly aligned system because although they are retired ACTs, every ACT is a little bit different, um, but they do measure very, very similar things. So we are, and we, Teachers are working their butts off. They really are, um, and I know they're as frustrated by this as, as anybody. Um, I do feel like I get a little impatient because when I look at the group of students in growth, um, there's 2,800 students in there because it's not a straight three-year average, 8 to 9, 9 to 10, 9 to, or 10 to 11. It is a three-year average of each of those sets of students. Um, so there's a lot of students in there. There are students in there from 18, 19 that we haven't seen or maybe dropped out three years ago. Um, and didn't even take the test, but they're still on our data set as far as showing growth or, or lack of growth. So it's going to take some time, um, but I understand that we're doing everything that we can to, to try to turn that around. 
Um, it is frustrating when we compare us to other districts, like I said. And the performance levels are there, it's just not that growth. But know that we need to get better with that because that's a group of students that deserve to grow as well. Yeah, I think even additionally to the work that you're doing with PLC, I think they've looked at the trimester schedule. Um, you know, we're trying to analyze what other things we can be looking at that might be playing a role or have an impact um, on our scores within growth and targeted groups. I think schedule, um, the grading practices, we talked to you guys at the beginning of the year about some of the grading practices. I do think we didn't shift any policy or changes within our grading, but our practices in the classroom are certainly have shifted and align with some of our PLC work that we're doing. So we're starting to do some of that work and holding kids accountable to here's the expectations on those power standards and learning targets and helping kids with that multi-levels of support system to make sure we get there. Yeah, I've talked to our staff about the last few years, especially the last few years coming off of COVID, that I feel like we've done a good job getting kids through classes, getting kids through graduation. But in doing that, we may have taught down a little bit um, to get them through rather than holding them to that higher standard of the skill. Um, it's not that they were doing it as a, a bad thing, but it was out of the, their heart trying to get the kid through and get a diploma. But in doing that, you need to, you know, we gave a little bit on the skill, so we need to get back to that, and we are this year for sure. Um, other thing we're doing is based on assessment results from this year, we are going to be developing some remedial type math and English language arts classes for reading and, and pre-ACT skills that based on student performance, they'll be then put into that for trimester one along with English nine for tries two and three and English 10 for tries two and three to try to give them, those students, a little bit more and extra support in those areas knowing that they may need that. The give on that is they're not going to be in some encore areas. Uh, that they may like, but obviously they need to do better in these skills. If trimesters are an, are determined to be an issue, is there an unwind button to that? That I know that's a lot of work. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we want to go there quite yet. I mean, the, a lot of the schools, three of them that I talked to, are in trimesters in our conference. It's okay. Watertown, it's Milton, and it's South I mean, They're not seeing the issues that we are. Um, I've asked what they're doing or not doing that, that we aren't or are. And honestly, they're not doing anything. They're, they haven't had any, had any new classes. They haven't went to all year math or English. Um, they're not doing the PLC work that we do. In fact, they're calling us because they'd like to start some of that. Um, so again, that's frustrating because we're, it seems like we're trying everything that we can to make these skills go the, go the opposite direction. Um, we also did some work on pulling data um, of students who are in that high growth group and then in the low growth group and then pulling when did they have English and math? Was it first try, third try? Was it first and second try, not third try? Was it not first try and then second and third try? And so far, from the schools that have been doing that, it's us in Sauk Prairie. We're not seeing a correlation with that. It really doesn't matter when they have English or math. So that doesn't seem to be the driving factor. Saying that though, it's always on the table, right? I mean, I don't think it's, I can't sit up here and say, no, never, I'm not ever going away. I mean, if it comes to be an issue and that seems to be the only lever left, then we look at that. Other questions? Is there, we used to see a special ed report card with all this stuff. Is there still that or why are we not? Seeing that separately too. Special ed is now in the target group. Outcomes. I see that, so they don't do. There's not a, a special report card for them. Yeah, to that's do. part of my annual pupil services report that I give in August. One other thing I, I, I should say too is, you know, as we, this is our first year implementing that PL. I know we've been talking about PLC for a long, long time, but this is the first year we've implemented the four question cycle and been able to intervene and been tracking the data and the skills. So we've really only been doing that for about 12 weeks. And then the targeted group outcomes, which is the first time that's been on the report card this year, um, we have a growing group, right? Our ELL students for the first time count for us at the high school. We had a group of 26 this or last year on last year's report card. And we've, before that, it's never counted. But thanks to you and some decisions we've made, we now have more support than ever in ELL, right? We have two staff, Hannah and Kata, working with that program. Um, special Ed is working really hard on um, progression of skills within their department. Um, and then the other area that really accounts in that group is economically disadvantaged. And I think we really have to start working on what are the barriers that those students see 
um, that aren't always academic. They are sometimes academic, but there's other things that we need to do too. And Cheryl, we do get a breakdown within the report card, the details of how our special ed kids perform, how our ELL students perform in relation to non-ELL or non-special ed students. I just, to finish up, I just wanted to revisit our district goals. I mean, I know you guys have seen this multiple times, but we believe in this work. We believe that, you know, Jeremy talked about all the things that we're doing within our, our PLC work within Priority Area A um, and putting all these pieces together and then within our work within the Priority Area B of building those systems of support. We have work to do there. I think we've identified some gaps that we've shared um, with you guys previously of in building those systems and preparing for next school year if we aren't able to do some things yet this year and making sure we have systems and, and resources and support that all buildings have the ability to provide kids with um, you know those three levels of support um, because we have kids that need it yeah, I, I told our staff today that if we can maintain that level of proficient advance the, the economic achievement and then reverse this trend and start that bottom 25 percent growing we're going to become one of the best schools in the state rather than where we are right now and, and that's doable I mean I, now that we're starting to focus on that lowest 25 um, and, on, and know exactly who those students are, I mean, it starts with having a goal, right? And knowing where they're at, and we haven't known that before. I think I just wanted to share an addition, because you guys have asked, I know Rich, who's not here, has asked, what kind of measures do you have in place throughout the year, right? Because we see this data one time, and we get one shot at it, right, in the spring with our students. Um, so do we have other data that we're looking at? We talked about Mastery Connect, which is classroom level data. We've got benchmarks in place where we're monitoring those standards and targets. And then we have uh, FastBridge data that we give fall, winter, spring, K-8. We're starting to give it to high school students to identify those kids in that bottom 25% um, to identify skill deficits. And then we have the Mastery Prep data um, that we give twice before the actual ACT. So we're able to look at what trends are we seeing if they're positive, that's good, reinforces our work. If it's not as positive, then we still have the ability to shift um, some gears and look at, okay, what's you know playing a factor in yeah. maybe that negative number. Yeah, and, our, and our staff works with that data, and it's been critical to have the days like today and we had one earlier in the year, to really take how those students are performing on Mastery Connect, but also on Mastery Prep and other, other areas, and then align it to their curriculum. Are we seeing the same thing? Um, is, is this measure showing us what we're seeing in the classroom? So. I think that's pretty critical. Knowing that we may make some errors in that, like when we're, they're assessed on those bigger measures, we might think they're higher than, than what they are in our classroom, or they're lower than what they are, and we, and we need to up that rate a little bit. So those days are critical to make sure that we are aligned with that, with those assessments of what our accountability measures are. So I'd like to come back probably in early February and provide an update with our FastBridge data, K-8, and then mastery prep data and give an update on where we're at with our mid-year data um, give you guys an update um, and then again with building level <coughs> report card information um, we'll provide insight on each building at the curriculum meeting in December other questions I have a question but thank you for the effort and I think it's really a focus at all the schools with you and Joe. Thank you and stay at it. We need better scores. Appreciate that Paul. Any other questions? Yes, thanks for the presentation. <coughs> An overview of our cards. Um, next on the agenda is um, referendum information, so I'll turn that over to Mr. Kibler. So this will just be uh, just a real quick overview of things that have been taking place since the referendum passed on November 8th. Um, so before Thanksgiving, uh, we did meet with city officials, city administrator, to look at some of their long-range planning and the process for annexing the property into the city, which is one of the requirements for one of the conditions for a purchase. So um, we do have that. That is something that will be done by the owners of the property prior to closing. It will be either done or in process by the time we close. Um, 
so that we had to go through that so we had that information so we know what the process is going to be and things that have to be done. Um, Ron has been having preliminary meetings with, uh, with PMA, what's the other, is it ADM, is that the other? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a couple, couple different financial institutes, we've met with Lisa Voison from uh, Baird multiple times and we're going to have several things coming up later tonight in the agenda regarding the finances which is accessing the funds, investing the funds and, and doing things like that. And then of course um, we're looking at setting the schedule um, for some of the different studies, so the environmental impact, the wetland um, delineation, traffic study, um, getting the soil samples, core samples, um, determining the survey points we were able to get on the site today. Um, it was it was still wet, but there was enough frost. We could get on there with a truck. I was going to call you, Phil, if I got stuck, by the way. Um, so we were able to get out there and take a look at things, and there's actually three spots on there that are natural areas for retention pond, and uh, it's uh, it, it looks a lot bigger with the corn off it. So um, so we'll be able to hopefully get some pins set. We're working with the uh, with the owners right now to possibly get some aerial photographs, and then we'll overlay that with the, the stuff that we have from the GIS so that we can see all the elevation changes and we'll get the engineer and the project manager out there in the next couple weeks so they can be on it too and we'll figure out where we're going to drop pins. So um, we do have a meeting of electors on December 12th which we're also going to talk about later in the agenda. So that's your update. Any questions or discussion? <clears throat> The next thing we need to do is um, call a special district meeting, and we have a resolution because um, we need to call a special meeting of the electors. And so I will read the resolution, be it resolved by the school board of the school district of Monroe, that a special meeting of the school district be held to act on the following item of business. Um, resolution authorizing the school board pursuant to section 120 10, parent 5M of the Wisconsin statutes to acquire real estate necessary for the school district purposes to wit approximately <coughs> 77 acres of vacant land situated east of 31st Avenue in the town of Monroe, Green County, Wisconsin, consisting of all land within tax parcel 230200576.0001. And a portion of the land within tax parcel 230200576.3000, and that such real estate be designated as the site for construction of a new high school and related facilities. The date of the special meeting shall be December 12, 2022. The special meeting shall commence at 6 o'clock p.m. and shall be held at the Bauer Education Center. 1220 16th Avenue, Monroe, Wisconsin. The district clerk is authorized to give notice of such meeting by, publica by publication of a class two notice in the form set forth on exhibit A, the last insertion of which shall be not more than eight or less than one day prior to the date fixed for the special meeting. So is there any um, questions or discussion on the consideration of a call for a special district meeting. Hearing none, I'm looking for a motion. So moved. Second. Is that Eric? Yes. Motion by Phil and seconded by Eric to approve the resolution presented for calling a special meeting of the electors for the approval of the land purchased for New High School. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. All right, so now we need to talk about the approval of high school referendum investment of bond proceeds. Yeah, with rates being as volatile as they've been uh, lately, um, I asked that uh, ADM, uh, American Deposit Management, and uh, PMA uh, Financial, uh, actually it's PMA, uh, asset management, uh, provide updates based upon today's uh, financing that's available, knowing that we won't have the final proceeds uh, and final investment numbers until uh, December 14th. And so in your packet, there are proposals from the two of them. Uh, given that, you know, the 
they're following the same investment uh, protocols as to what the draw schedule is uh, and, and when we're receiving the proceeds and, and what that draw schedule looks like. Uh, when they came in, I was a little surprised how wide the variance was, and so I'll talk a little bit about that and what I've been working on today. Um, when, when PMA, or I should say when ADM's proposal first came in, they were a little over $6.9 million uh, in investment proceeds over the life of the project. Um, uh, I did notice that they had 12-1 as the receipt of funds date. Uh, we're not getting those funds until 12-14, so I contacted them and asked them to make that update. When I got the update back, they had changed the date, but I hadn't changed any of their other numbers, and so I then contacted them and I said, well, you're, you're going to at least have a left one half of a month of less proceeds in this first month, uh, and a half a month at, you know, $88 million is about 144000 so that's a big number. So they didn't make that change, and that's the, the proposal you see uh, in your packet. It's uh, six million eight hundred. Get over there, six million eight hundred twenty thousand seven hundred thirty-nine dollars <throat> of net proceeds over the course of the life of the project. One number I haven't been able to track down, and I stepped out to try and call them a little bit ago, is their estimated CD placement fee of two hundred nineteen thousand eight hundred forty dollars. <throat> I would expect to see that reducing the AMA balance, uh, which is the second or third column there from the left. And so you see it went from 87,950. Uh, they placed 74,900,000 uh, of CD balance in, on, on January 1 is what the plan would be. And so I would expect that 13,163.82 to, yes, include those cumulative earnings uh, from the month of December, but <coughs> net of that CD placement fee, and that net isn't there. So I have a question to them if they've truly netted that amount out or not. And so we may be making a proposal, or I'll be suggesting we make a recommendation here contingent upon learning that factor. PMA's proposal uh, came in, and, and I'll talk, there's a, there's a secondary document there as well. Uh, their proposal came in, uh, they were looking at Six million two hundred seventeen thousand five hundred nineteen dollars, or five hundred ninety dollars, significantly less. However, you'll see their CD rates are, for the most part, higher than uh, EDMs, and their their fees are less. What they proposed, or what they gave us for a proposal, was strictly the investments, and so they looked at the dates that we needed to make our draw schedules, and said, "Here's the investments that come due on those days, and these are the returns you would get on those investments." What that doesn't include then is, you know, we can use the month of, say, uh, you know, November 2023 as an example, where you're going to have a, a CD of $152,000 know, coming due uh, that you're going to use to pay bills with, but you're going to have all the revenue or all the interest from that CD uh, I should say, I'm sorry, the, let me make sure I get my column headers right here. That's the actual interest income. So you're getting $152,000 of $859 of interest income that's coming due from that CD on that day that you don't need to pay bills with, right? The, the, the investment CD was for the amount that you're going to pay your bill. That's money that potentially becomes liquid dollars. They don't include that in liquid funds because they say, well, you know, sometimes costs go up, sometimes you need to draw on those dollars during the course of the project, so they typically don't factor those in. The ADM was factoring that in, and so all that, those interest dollars on all those CD earnings that you see in that uh, column that says interest income, and in some months you can see it's as much as $400,000, they're not then calculating interest on that going forward. So they did then provide an additional document uh, when I asked them to uh, casting that interest revenue forward in a liquid condition, and it's two hundred eighty-nine thousand uh, dollars. What that is doesn't factor in is first, it's only simple interest, and secondly, they're using a very conservative liquid rate as the rate of today, which is three point six three percent. The U.S. Treasury rate today is is four and a half percent, so their liquid rate is going to be going up to that liquid. Uh, that U.S. Treasury rate here in the near future, it's gone from 2.4 to 3.6. 
over the last about four to five months. And so they'll quickly be up to four or five. And so what I'm estimating is that their interest income is probably going to be somewhere around 6.6 .6 million uh, by the time it's, it's all said and done. And so what we have is an ADM proposal at 6.8 million, uh, 6.8 uh, $28 million dollars uh, with a $219,000 fee that we're just not sure about uh, and of which you know if you look at their liquid number they're using four and a half percent throughout the project the nice thing I would say about PMA using 363 if rates should happen to go down on the back side of this as quickly as they came up which I don't <coughs> think is probably gonna happen but it could right uh, there they could be being a little optimistic on what their what their uh, interest uh, proceeds estimates are compared to what PMA is estimating using a very conservative 3.63. Um, so my recommendation, uh, not knowing what the clarification is on that uh, CD placement fee, but two hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money, would be that we uh, proceed with ADM contingent upon their placement fee being factored into their proceeds estimate going forward. However, <coughs> that you give me the authority that if that placement fee in any way lowers their investment earnings that we would then work with PMA. Uh, I think PMA was a little more conservative. I think PMA uh, you know, it's a little more correct probably in their information. We've had a couple of adjustments to ADMs throughout the day today. Um, they're both good companies. I think part of it is just the holiday in there and uh, who's in their office working on their things. Um, I don't have a concern about working with ADM. Uh, I just uh, want to make sure that I know what I'm getting as far as uh, apples to apples and I'm, you know, I'm a little frustrated that we had to change the numbers uh, a couple times today. So to, to summarize, Ron, <clears throat> right now the way it looks, if EDM number our numbers are correct and we get the correct, what was the? They didn't give us the number. The six point eight million, uh, just a little over six point eight million. But they didn't. Did they give us a direct number for their fee in there? Also, is that taken? Uh, that the placement fee was two nineteen eight forty. So that comes out of that six eight. Right, yeah. and they have, they have a separate fee of twenty five hundred dollars to do the arbitrage rebate, which is included in PMAs. But uh, yeah. so that would be sitting. That would be sitting about two hundred thousand dollars over the conservative estimate from PMA. Right. So what what you're asking is for the board to approve once we get things squared away. If ADM, if their numbers hold, that and we and that's a higher amount. That's who we would work with. But if it, after they get their numbers, their correct numbers in, and everything is is confirmed. If it's less, then we would go with camera. Yeah, and I, I would even say if, it, if even if it just adjusts out, because it could adjust out one of two ways. It could be that that two hundred nineteen thousand <coughs> is not netted out of their CD incomes, and so it truly is a reduction of two hundred nineteen thousand dollars of uh, of, uh, of CD revenues, or it could be that that two hundred nineteen thousand should have came out of the upfront liquid funds, and so if you take you know. A couple hundred thousand at, at four uh, percent. That's eight thousand a month over thirty-six months. That's also going to get you over a couple hundred thousand, right? So, if it's not factored out of either one of those lines that it should have been, then I would recommend we go with PMA. Uh, so I, that's why I said I, I would recommend that we go with ADM, provided the numbers they we're seeing. Uh, and, the, and the fees that are in there are truly representative of what they're showing us. If they're in any way not, that we you then have me authorize me to move forward with PMA. Yeah, it doesn't look like it started out that way, if, right? I, right. Based on what they put in their proposal. Yeah, I see. It's, I'm not seeing it netting out of their uh, their liquid line. So, it, it, I, well, I know it's not because I ran the numbers about five times this afternoon. And it, 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 I'm not seeing it. What's your gut instinct run on ADM's rate of returns? And do you think the overshot? I, I think the the on the on the liquid numbers they're being the, the they're being realistic uh, in the next eighteen months. 
Um, we're seeing U.S. Treasuries right now at four and a half percent on for a 12-month U.S. Treasury. So I have no doubt, no doubt that their liquid account is moving toward that. What I can't tell you is in December of 2024, or when you get to their like 731 of 2025, when you know the kind of the CD range has come to an end, we still have funds that are sitting out there. Are we still going to be seeing 4.5% in 2025? That I can't tell you if that's, uh, and they'll tell you that they can't either. They're basing it upon the rates that they know as of today. Uh, PMA is also basing it on the rates as, as they know it of today, but they're using literally what their liquid account is today. Uh, ADM is you know, factoring in kind of what they're looking at the U.S. Treasury rate being. Uh, if you look at what the CD rates are on the two proposals, uh, again, you can see most of uh, PMA's CD rates are anywhere from 485 to uh, 505. Now they take 10% uh, out of that as a fee. Uh, most of ADM's rates that you see are anywhere from 418 to 485, so lower interest rates. Uh, and then they have the net 219 total sum that comes out. So again, it's, it's really in that liquid rate that, that we re really don't know where it's going to go, where, where ADM is kind of making up their ground, and so where, where PMA is being a little more conservative. So in that sense, I have a little bit of comfort with PMA. Uh, so if they get to being equal, that's why I'm recommending it be PMA. Uh, however, if it's a $200,000 difference, then, then obviously we want to work with ADM. Any other questions and discussion? Tim, if you can verbalize what I said, otherwise I can read I, it. I, 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 I'll try. How about that? There you go. Uh, I'll make a motion to use ADM as the company for the high school referendum investment of bond proceeds contingent upon the fee discussion that Ron will have with them and that it, it is netted out in the proceeds. Um, as presented. As presented. If not, authorizing Ron to um, make the decision to go with PMA as the alternative in that case. I would second that elaborate motion. <laughs> I'd be one of the longer ones we've ever had. <clears throat> Good. So a motion by Tim and a second by Phil to use ADM um, contingent on all the things Tim mentioned um, and giving Ron the authority to switch if things if need be. All those in favor by voice vote indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carried. Next item is there's a resolution uh, for WISC, uh, which is uh, uh, an investment consortium that a number of municipalities and school districts use in the state. Uh, we always traditionally use the local government uh, investment pool, uh, so we haven't been a WISC member. Uh, however, even if we were not to go with PMA, it doesn't hurt us to become a WISC member. There's, there's, there's no cost just to be a member. Uh, and it gives us another investment tool that we could use if uh, the rates should happen to, to be greater than the local government investment pool. When rates were so low, it didn't really matter, but certainly now as rates are rising, uh, the pools are kind of uh, uh, coming up uh, at, at a pretty good clip. Uh, and, and the nice thing is, is usually once it crests and it starts to fall, they also have a, a kind of a, on that lagging side, they also usually have greater returns. So it's always good to have that to consider. Since we would need to be a member of them if we do end up going with PMA, we, we need to pass the resolution, but it's also good even if we're, we don't end up going with PMA. Did you say there's no cost? There's no cost. The management fee is, is built into the proceeds if you have, if you use them. Any questions or discussion about using the Wisconsin Investment Series cooperative? 
and becoming a member. That's what we're doing ultimately, right? Becoming mm -hmm. a member. Yes. And there's no cost and no really no not, risk not on the obligation not on the the district. Front, no. not, not until you put your funds in there, and it's just built into the, the, the rate structure. So there is a resolution in our board docs to participate in the fund, and it's a resolution authorizing entry into an intergovernmental cooperation agreement relating to the Wisconsin Investment Series Cooperative and authorizing participation in the investment programs of the fund. Um, there's all kinds of information that goes along with that, but it will be monitored by, obviously, Ron Olson, Rodney, Heather Seashaw, and Julie Fry. Um, and you guys are free to look at the, the entire resolution as it's presented in board decks. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution. Second. So I have a motion by Tim and a second by Cheryl to approve the resolution authorizing entry into an intergovernmental cooperation agreement relating to the Wisconsin Investment Series Cooperative and authorizing participation in the investment programs of the fund. All those in favor by voice vote signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. <clears throat> Lisa Boyson will be joining us for the next two items. I know Lizzie's got her pulled up. Lizzie, is, is it the Google Meet, that, or do, are we, do we have a Zoom that I need to pull up? No, it's just the Google Meet. Because I think I might have to move to the middle, and you guys might have to get volume off of me unless it comes off of the TV. So if we cast yours to the TV, the sound will come from the TV. Otherwise, it will just come from your computer. Okay, so I'll, I'll join, and then I'll... You said you're going to cast it. Yep. Just give me one second here to cast this over. Did I lose my cast? I queued up earlier. Lisa, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? I can. <laughs> Let me adjust my volume, then I'll see how. So, can I speak again? Hi, everybody. That's fine. Right. That'll work. We'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Well, thank you for um, letting me come on virtually. It has been a very busy night for me. This is my third board meeting. <laughs> but I, I don't have a lot to say. I mean, we went through the entire plan when I was there on the 16th. Um, I do have, I think it's good news that we uh, locked in the uh, item F, which is the authorizing resolution for the bond anticipation note. So again, that's the bridge loan. And um, so that's the first resolution would be locking in that bond anticipation note. We locked in a 3.7%, which is a great rate. We had a really good market the last couple weeks. And um, I, I was really very, very happy uh, with it. We met as a team, uh, me and Mr. Figueroa and Ron, and we talked about the possibility of going to the open market um, versus uh, placing it with the bank, which is what I've done for a very long time. And this was what, about a month ago, we, we discussed it and went through it. And in the end, that decision saved us about $356,000 in interest costs. So we did the right thing. Uh, so that's the first one. The second one is the parameters resolution, which you have a draft, uh, or a, you should have a copy of. It's a long resolution that basically lays out all the parameters for the long-term bonds. So I'll pause there and see if there's any questions. And I think, uh, Lisa, just uh, not to get too far into the weeds, I think the, because uh, we'll have the coupons coming out uh, later this week for, for the board president to sign, but I believe, uh, in essence, they were 
coupon rate is four, but they have a, a premium on them, and that's how you get down to your your net rate of, of the three point yeah. seven three. Yeah, you'll pay four percent, but because there's a little bit of premium, you'll have some cash at closing, so the net rate is that three percent. And that cash stays in the debt service to help pay off, whether it be uh, this year's. Uh, loan or, or the subsequent ban or the subsequent yep. bonds that we issue in the spring. Sure. Mm -hmm. But the 88 million will be deposited December 14th. Yep, December 14th and start interest as planned. So everything's on as planned. Okay, and uh, so you are aware, I don't know, I don't think you could hear, so we will have your, who it's going to finalize tomorrow. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure out the CD placement fee, if ADM has that netted in there or not. We didn't see that it was, and so if um, it is, then we'll be with ADM. If it's not, then we'll switch to PMA, so, uh, but we'll know that okay. probably midday tomorrow. Okay, it, it likely is, I'll just say, from my experience, but yeah. we'll see. Okay. And then do you want to talk a little bit about the, we, you talked at the last meeting about the parameter set, or do you want to wait till we make that resolution, or pass that resolution? No, I, I can talk about the parameters resolution. So it's eight pages of uh, a lot of legal language, but the, what you care about is that we're setting the parameters for the bonds. So we're setting, one of the things that we're doing is we're setting the amortization schedule on that second page, but we have all kinds of flexibility built in there. Um, so that, uh, that is in there, and um, the not to exceed borrowing amount of the $88 million, we can increase or decrease any of the principal payments by $5 million uh, per year. We uh, will determine the call date or the redemption provisions uh, as it gets closer, so we have that built in there. Um, a lot of this other stuff is very boilerplate. Uh, boilerplate uh, language and just because I can't pull mine up because I'm talking to you uh, I believe um, there may be a date in there but is that date set in stone or is that just or do you still have the latitude to wait and see how the market looks the date is not set in stone we are definitely going to watch the market we do have a not to exceed, I forgot to mention that, interest rate in there on the top of page three. I thought you did. Uh, we just put a 6%. So, I mean, we're not going to lock in 6%, but we can be some flexibility there in case something might happen. Hopefully we keep going in the right trend like we did with this month. So, we'll see. Yeah. Yep. Questions from the board? So it says expected to be dated December 14th, but that's flexible, that's what you're saying? Yeah. yeah, so the question was, it says expected to be dated April 14th, but it's flexible, correct? December, December or just, 14th. Yeah. Well, no, the resolution is, I'm just trying to... For the parameters? I thought there was a mark there, so... I, I'm not, I don't have it. I got it for you, Yeah, um, we just said dated on or after March 1st. And the reason why we do that, that is set in stone. So we have to date it on or after March 1st because the payment dates are March 1st, so we want to go the full 20 years. If so we date it February 1st, then we couldn't go out to 2040. Right. The date, the date they were seeing is uh, December 14th. So you can't have, you can't go out for your bonds until after you receive your bond anticipation notes. So our bond anticipation notes close on December 14th. Okay. And so the resolution Focus. takes effect after we've received our bond anticipation no proceeds. So that's why you see that. Yep. 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 Other questions for Lisa? So again, it pretty much covers what she talked about um, two weeks ago when we talked and uh, just gives us uh, the ability to go out and lock in within these this set of parameters at, at a time that looks like it's a good market in the spring. So the first thing we have to do is the bond anticipation notes. That's the first motion. Yep. Um, which is, like Ron said, the initial borrowing to get us funding for the initial expenditures we'll have and to start earning interest proceeds until we can get our rating and do our bond insurance issuance in the spring. Um, and so we're looking for a motion 
to approve the resolution authorizing the issuance and sale of 88 million bond anticipation notes pursuant to section 67 <coughs> Point twelve, parent one, parent B, Wisconsin statutes. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Nikki and a second by Eric to approve the resolution authorizing the issuance and sale of 88 million bond anticipation notes pursuant to section um, 67.12, parent one, parent B, Wisconsin statutes. And Nikki will do this as a roll call vote. Okay. Nikki Austin, yes. Rich is absent. Eric Eckdahl? Yes. Terry Ellison? Yes. Teresa Keen? Yes. Cheryl McGuire? Yes. Dylan McGuire? Yes. Bill Vosper? Yes. Tim Wolf? Yes. Okay. We'll do the next as a one call vote too, but the next one is approval of the resolution authorizing <coughs> issuance and establishing parameters for the sale <coughs> of not to ex and not to exceed 88 million general obligation ref refunding bonds. Um, and so we would need a motion to approve that, like I said, the resolution author authorizing the issuance and establishing parameters for the sale of not to exceed 88 million in general obligation refunding bonds. Second. Motion by Tim and a second by Terry. Um, Nikki, can you do a roll call vote, please? Yep. Nikki Austin, yes. Rich Jeffrey Lebson. Eric Eckdahl? Yes. Terry Allison? Yes. Teresa King? Yes. Cheryl McGuire? Yes. Dylan McGuire? Yes. Phil Vosberg? Yes. Tim Wolf? Yes. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Thank Lisa. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. So we are on to informational items. We have board membership <coughs> and administration. So just uh, one thing, uh, so currently right now we would traditionally have one board meeting in December. Mm -hmm. So it would just be noticed that we will not have a board meeting on December 26th, um, unless of course something comes up and we have to call a special meeting. So there would be one board meeting in December, it would be December 12th, and there would be no second more monthly board meeting on December 26th. I have um, received no other Board of Education correspondence, committee reports. Eric? Nothing. Dylan? Nothing. Terry? The Library Board met and starting January 1st of 2023, they will no longer be charging any late fees for any, for any, for any books or individuals they will be walking away from that they will also be rolling out a new logo so kind of it'll be a freshened up logo and that will be in correspondence to the remodel that they will be starting next year so no more fees moving forward no late fees but they do no overdue fees but they do if anything is lost or not returned because it's lost then they will charge we'll have to charge the replacement value of that so that's it Nikki we will have a curriculum meeting on the 12th prior to the regular board meeting so we will get the agenda up to that Tim. That's uh, oh. really quick. That's also the same night as the 6 p.m. meeting, right? So curriculum. Oh, like correct. Todd, what are we? Yeah, that's we just did the authorization. We just talked. Uh, yeah. To have a 6 so p.m. meeting that night. Earlier or? Probably would. Yeah, because that meeting, I was thinking we would even need longer than possibly 60 minutes to go through some of the information, but for the for the curriculum. For the curriculum. We can do it in an hour. Well, we we will. Todd and I will we'll talk about the date and time that will work. Thank okay. you for bringing that up because nope. I wasn't thinking that we had that okay. fixed. Okay. Uh, yeah. Finance met this evening. Uh, we just went through financials. So, no. Not sure. All right. Um, agenda items for future discussion. Rich just wanted me to note that on the twelfth we will go into closed session at, to discuss the superintendent. Um, review his goals and objectives. Oh, so we do that. 
Any other items for future discussion? All right, liaison reports. I don't see anybody. I haven't received any emails, and I don't see the press here. So I need one final motion at 8.09. So motion by Cheryl, and a second by Second. Tim. To adjourn, all those in favor by voice vote signify by say aye. 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 We are adjourned.